many of you are excited that it's finally football season. Uh, some of you have been celebrating for a while now. Uh, we made it to the Columbus High game Friday night, uh, another victory for our local boys, and that was exciting to be a part of. Uh, some of you are here today uh, because you are, well, seeking encouragement after a tough day of football. Some of you are here to offer prayers and seek intercession for your defense. <laughs> and many of you are here wishing that you were at home setting your fantasy lineup. Well, I can't do much for you on that but to say, hey, why don't you put down the phones just for a few minutes now and, and let's engage together as the church, as the body of Christ. Now, when I think of football, I think of a lot of different things, but one of the things as a pastor is I think of the team concept that's involved with football. Even if you don't know much about football, you can appreciate that some guys are faster than other guys. Some guys are more agile than other guys. Some guys are a lot tougher than other guys. And some guys, well, they're just a lot bigger than other guys. And so across the football field are, are these teams lined up getting ready to battle, and we know that it takes a large amount of variety when you hit the field. Now take, for instance, today, uh, the Carolina Panthers are going to be playing their first home game. Now, you may not know this, but I am a Carolina Panther fan, not because I've ever spent any amount of time in Carolina, but because I thought it would be cool to follow a team since its beginning. And so since 1995, before Cam Newton was ever a part of the NFL, I've been a, a Carolina Panther fan. And it's exciting to get ready for that. But in the offseason, you're kind of building up for this kickoff. And you're wondering, how is the team going to fix all of the flaws that they had last year? Who's going to replace who? And you know what? You're in trouble like we were last year if every one of your draft picks is a defensive back. You just know that you're going to have a weak secondary going in. And some of those guys are, are very well equipped to play that position. And you would not want them on the offensive line because they are going to get bowled over. Uh, there are special guys, we call them quarterbacks, that are analyzing the field, that have special skill sets to, to just be able to, to digest all of the information coming at them. And they throw the ball or they hand it off, or sometimes they take the hand off themselves and, and run the ball. But you don't want that person in the trenches taking the hits. It just would be a nightmare waiting to happen. And those big guys, we'll call them Bubba, like you don't want them running the ball. Because their feet don't move that fast. Every once in a while, you find some rare athlete that's like 6, 8, 300 pounds that can just get those wheels turning. And if you find that guy, move. Right? This is going to hurt. I, I played a, a little football when I was younger, just like those scrimmage games. And we played tackle football in the snow. Anybody ever done that? Tackle football in the snow? It's good times. But I remember going out and playing with some of my friends, and somebody invited a coworker to come along. And no joke, this dude is at least 6'6", 300 pounds plus. And the very first thought I had when I met him was not like, hey, man, it's good to see you. It's like, I hope he's not on the other team. Sure enough, he was. First play, splat, I'm done. He just took me out. I am not big enough to take those hits. And now I'm too old to take those hits. Right? It takes diversity. It takes a lot of different people doing a lot of different jobs, having a lot of different skills to come together as a team. And today we're going to take a look at, at some people who acknowledged that and wanted to work together as a team. And what they were actually trying to build was not a football team, but a church. A church in their context would be a temple. So the Israelites... They had been in Egypt. They're going to the promised land. 
Now, the church had always been portable. Some of you have been with us from the beginning, and you understand portable church. You understand living out of a trailer, setting up, tearing down. The tabernacle, well, that was a lot worse. They didn't have trailers or trucks to pull the trailers. Like, you just strap it on, and you carry all of this stuff. And so they, they set up this tent, and so they had these big tent revivals constantly because that's where the presence of God was at. That's where the Ark of the Covenant that held the Ten Commandments, that's where it was at. But now, as David is leading the Israelites, they've been able to conquer some of the enemies around them. He's wanting to build a permanent structure for the Ark of the Covenant, for the presence of God, called the Temple. So 1 Chronicles chapter 22, starting at verse 6, is where we're going to be at here uh, this morning. Page numbers are on the screen for the Bibles we provide. If you brought your own, I don't know the page number, sorry. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 6. So then he, David, called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, my son, I had it in mind to in, in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood before men on the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all of his surrounding enemies. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. The first thing I want you guys to notice about this passage is that there were two men involved. We have David, and we have his son Solomon. David and Solomon both had different roles to play. That's not to say because David couldn't build the temple of God that his war was in error. You see, the Israelites didn't drive out the inhabitants of the land that they were moving to, and God told him, or told the people, that, that these people would be thorns in your side. These people are going to drive you crazy. And even through the, the, the time of the judges, we see the ebb and the flow of the Israelites battling this struggle. And David comes in and begins to annihilate the enemies around him. He had a special calling to do that. However, that special calling was not to build the temple. On the other hand, Solomon, well, Solomon was going to be given the, the, the kingdom in a time of peace. David is already conquered. And in that time of peace, Solomon's job was to build a temple. Now, you and I, at different places in our lives, different skill sets that we bring to the table, have a role to do, but it's probably different than the role of the people around us. And so when you, you see this, I want you to see that both men had a role to play. We're going to read on in verse 11. Now, my son, the Lord be with you, so that you may succeed in building the house of the Lord your God as he has spoken concerning you. Only may the Lord grant you discretion and understanding that when he gives you charge over Israel, you may, you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes and the rules that the Lord commanded Moses for Israel. The second thing that I think we can learn from this passage is that, that David knew that God had a role to play. David couldn't conquer all of those other country civilizations on his own power. It's when he submitted himself to God that real conquest happened. Conquest that was not just military, but conquest of the heart surrendered to God. David also knew that for his son Solomon to succeed in his role, though it was different from his, he was also going to have to submit to God to his commands, to his rules, to the way that he wanted him to build and to lead a group of people. So you and I, we need to understand from this as well that we, we have a role to play, but we can't forget that it's under submission to God and his role to play. 
verse 15, I want you to see a little something else about David. You have an abundance of workmen, he's telling Solomon. And he goes on to explain some of the different roles. Some are stone cutters, some are masons, some are carpenters. There are all sorts of, of kinds of craftsmen without number. There's a lot of guys that know how to do a lot of stuff. Put them to work. It's kind of what he's saying. And he, he describes it like they're gifted in different areas. Some are good with gold, some silver, uh, some with bronze, some with iron. So make sure that you use these guys. Verse 17, David also commanded all the leaders of Israel to help Solomon his son. Not only are the, the skilled craftsmen going out, but all the leaders are now encouraged to go support Solomon. And then through the next few chapters, uh, 23 through 27, we see how David is taking a, a group of people. There were 12 tribes of Israel. Israel was a man, it's not a country. And so 12 sons, and one of those was Levi. Levi's family was in charge of the tabernacle. They were in charge of keeping it, cleaning it, making sure that it was transported, set up, taken down, all that stuff. And so that was their job. So now David is taking those people, and now we're focusing on the temple. And it, it says just by the headings, at least in my Bible, that David organizes the Levites. David organizes the priests. David organizes the musicians. David, or, or there are divisions within the gatekeepers. There are treasurers and there are other officials. There are military divisions and there are leaders of the tribes. You can see as, as he's going through this list of things to do to prepare for Solomon to take the reins, he understands that Solomon couldn't do it alone. David understood for him to build this temple really meant that he couldn't do it on his own. He had a job to play. Solomon had a job to play. But God also has a role to play. And then verse 16, I want you to get one little bit of information from David as he wraps up. Chapter 22 He says to the, the craftsmen, arise and work. The Lord is with you. He says to Solomon, his son, a few verses previous, be strong and courageous. Fear not and do not be dismayed. He says to the leaders in Israel, is not the Lord your God with you? One of the primary roles for David as a leader of the people was to assign their roles, but to encourage them to get out there and do the job. And I want to share with you guys how this applies in our context. You see, for them, they were building a church. They were building a temple. They were building the dwelling place of God. For you and I, we must understand that we are building a church. Three years in, self-supporting, we're now thinking beyond ourselves and able to minister in other parts of the community, the state, and even the world. But we're also understanding that God made a promise through Jesus when he said that when I go and leave this place, when I go back to heaven, I'm going to send someone who's going to be a companion for you, the Holy Spirit, to indwell you, to be inside of you. You see, from the beginning in Genesis, God was with man, but our sins separated us from God. But when Jesus was here, he was Emmanuel, God with us. So when he moved on to heaven, he gave us this promise that the Spirit of God, for those who believe, could indwell them, and God would be with man. And this is a seal of a greater promise that one day Jesus is coming back, and the dwelling place of God will once again be with man. And so it wasn't necessarily in the most holy place inside of a tent or into the holy of holies inside of a temple, but it was actually with the people. And I believe as much as Solomon was building a structure, he needed to build a people. He needed to find out their different gifts, talents, and abilities and encourage them to put them to work under the authority of God. And so here in this church, I think there's some things that as pastors we can learn and you can learn with us. Number one, you have two pastors here, myself and Josh who is leading us in worship. We both have roles to play. And we need to do our different roles. 
And as we grow, there's more and more people to minister to and different ways to minister to those people. But if the pastors are going to continually lead the church without submitting first to God, we're going to have problems. Because we're going to lead it under our own effort and our own energy. And maybe we can be successful for a while. But eventually we're going to run out of our own power, our own steam. And so we need to remember that God also has a role to play. We also have to remember, like David, that we can't do it alone. And we haven't from the beginning. It's crazy. There's been so many people that have supported us along the way. People that have never stepped foot inside of one of our worship services, who have given financially, who, is, who have offered up prayers, who have been there on the outside supporting us to encourage you to, to make a difference that has allowed God to, to step into your life at this moment in time and to share some truth with you. But when we started three years ago and we're set up, we needed people in the kids' ministry and people up on the stage doing worship ministry. And we had to have people who were willing to go serve in the community and all sorts of different people who had different skill sets and abilities, different time and availability uh, requirements that could come in and really make this body work together. But the whole time, the pastors are encouraging that group of people to operate under the authority of God himself. Which brings me to the last point, that as the pastors, one of our primary focuses should be on the encouragement of the body and I remember that my church planning coach at the time told me this as we were uh, breaking through the 100 mark on a consistent basis. He's like, your leadership style is going to change. You have to be an encourager. And I thought, oh man, this is going to stink. I don't know how the rest of you guys do it encouraging. I, I kind of feel like I tank it most of the time. I'm getting better. I, I'm really a work in progress. Yeah, I want to know... I want other people to know, and I've, I've even tried to incorporate some of these things at home because it's really easy for me to do the critical side of things. And maybe that's you, right? The easy thing to do is to walk in, it's been a long day, and how about that didn't get done, and that didn't get done, and how come you're doing that over there? I can do the same thing at church. You could probably do the same thing at work. But instead of walking in and going, man, hey, I'm so glad that, that you're here and, and how was your day and, and I love you. You want know, to be able to embrace that. Ephesians in chapter 4, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he says this in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning or by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with it, with it, is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So the pastors have a, a job to play too, to encourage the body, to build it up. But the, the church has a role to play. Every person has a role to play. Every, every one of you is a part of the body of Christ. Now let me address it from maybe a different angle. How many of you have a job? How many of you work someplace? Uh, this even means if you just work at home, it's not just at home, like you have a job to play. All right. How many of you, uh, you go to school? So out of all of you that raised your hands, how many of you knew the very first day that you walked in what your job was going to be and you knew how to do it? Anybody? Most of us don't do that, right? That's crazy. Yet at the same time, when it comes to a place like church, it's like, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, here, I, I've got an idea. How about we show up and we learn how to do that? And if it doesn't work, we move on and we learn how to do something different. 
And sometimes you learn how to do it by, by experiencing it. Like I went to a factory one summer and I knew within a week, this isn't where I need to be. Like this does not fit me. I was going crazy. Now, I need to tell you that I was putting in four hours a day and at the end of four hours, I felt like I'd been there for a week. I'm like this just doesn't fit me. Now, some of you, you are, you are uniquely created to be able to exist in that kind of an environment. I love the flexibility of being a pastor. And one minute I'm doing this, and the next minute I'm doing that, and another minute I'm doing here, and at the end of the day, I'm trying to figure out what in the world I got accomplished. But I need that diversity, the ability to be creative. So all of us have a role to play. Let me personalize it to you. Guys, you have a role to play. We need to figure out what that is. But you need to understand that your role to play always needs to be lived out in submission to God's role in your life. And God also has a role to play. And number three, no matter how great you are, you cannot do it alone. Some of you, you, you came in here today because you're tired, you're hurting, you're broken because you've been trying to do it on your own. You've been trying to do life on your own. You've been trying to take care of kids on your own. You've been trying to work multiple jobs on your own. You've been trying to pay the bills on your own. And you are broken and you are hurting and your burden is heavy. And some of you are coming in here today because you don't know how to ask for help. And you're just hoping maybe you'll glean something. But I want you to know that you can't do it on your own. You were never meant to do it on your own. You first submit to God, and then you work with God's people to accomplish something so great that you could never have done it on your own. And the fourth thing is this, that you and I must remember to encourage one another. It says in the book of Hebrews that, that we should not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but, but that we would encourage each other, that we would spur one another on even more as we see the day of God approaching. Guys, that means that you and I as the church, we come together, one of our primary focuses is to encourage one another to get back out there in the world and do something for heaven's sake and to make an impact. So what's your next step? And maybe you don't even know what your role is. Maybe you don't feel like, like you're bringing any value to the table. And I gotta tell you, you are. You are important. God made you for a purpose. There are skills, talents, and abilities that you bring to the table that you need to use. And we don't always know what's in your ministry toolbox. We don't know what your background is. We don't know how God can use and redeem some of your brokenness because we don't know what your brokenness is. We don't know what, what kind of things that maybe you even do for a living that we would be able to utilize for the ministry of God. But I need to tell you this, that sometimes we over-spiritualize this, and I think that we should spiritualize it because gifts come from God. They're supernatural, but there's a lot of ability in this room. There's a lot of people that are skilled laborers and craftsmen, that are leaders in their community and in their workplace. They can all come together to accomplish something so great that only God could make that happen. Now, some of you are simply just trying to do it all on your own. And your next step needs to be, I give up. I need help. Somebody throw me a bone here. Somebody, somebody come to my aid. And we, you and I need to learn how to get past our pride and actually ask for help. Or maybe in our job we have to train people up to know how to help us. We have to submit ourselves to that. Uh, some of you, you need, you need to be encouraged. You need to be loved. And many of us, all of us, need to encourage one another. I think one of the things that helps us out of our own brokenness is when we get the opportunity to minister, to serve into somebody else's brokenness. And so when we love them, when we encourage them, when we see a smile on their face or a big thank you or, or just a big bear hug, we know we've made a difference. And somehow in making a difference in somebody else's day brightens ours. 
And it's crazy to think how when we humble ourselves, just like Jesus, and we serve, God uses that for his glory. Today we have an amazing opportunity for you. It's called a ministry fair. And so in just a bit, the double doors are going to open up and you're going to be invited to come out and to see what kind of ministry opportunities exist here at Connection. You're going to be able to figure out where are some ways that you can get plugged in and help and to learn and to grow in your own spirit. You're going to find ways that you can serve both in the, the church and in the community. And we want you all to be able to at least step out there and sample that. And if nothing else, it's close to lunchtime. There's some snacks out there. Right? And so just step out those doors, take a look, mingle, mix with some people, get to know who you're, you're serving along with. And we're so glad to have you here. Now, I'm going to leave you with these words of David as he's talking to the, the, the workers. He says this, arise and work. The Lord is with you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to serve, to love, to share, to embrace, to encourage to get beyond ourselves and to build your kingdom. And we pray that you would help us as we continue to grow not our church, but your church. A church whose presence with God is more than a building, more than a tabernacle. But it's ministering to the hurting, to the broken, to the lost. And Father, it's a church that ministers to one another, encourages one another, builds each other up. Help us get beyond ourselves and to lean on you. Father, help us to soak in these words, arise and work. And let us never forget the promise that you are with us. And when you are with us, nothing is impossible.